views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Bronx Talk. Tonight we present a debate of sorts. It is for the Democratic primary in the 85th Assembly District, and that is the district that includes the uh, Bronx neighborhoods of Soundview, Classic Point, Harding Park, Castle Hill, and Hunts Point. And I'll tell you more about why I said of sorts in just a moment. Tonight's program is for an open seat in the 85th Assembly District. The vacancy was created when incumbent Marcos Crespo uh, decided to not seek re-election. The program tonight is presented in conjunction with the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase major understanding of major public policy issues. Our co-sponsors tonight are the Bronx Times and Schneps Media. Primary is on June 23rd. And uh, why I said of sorts, there actually are two candidates on the ballot for the 85th, but unfortunately only one of the candidates will be with us tonight. William Russell Moore did not respond to either email, phone, nor text. So only one of the two, Kenny Burgess, Burgos, will be on uh, the program tonight. I do want to just have a word. This is our fifth uh, debate uh, that we're running uh, through this campaign season. And we've had a number of candidates decide uh, not to participate. And uh, from an editorial point of view, I, I don't understand it. You go through the whole process of getting signatures, getting yourself on the ballot. Sometimes there's challenges you have to go through and, and you, do, you do all that work and then you don't take the opportunity to present yourself to the voters. It's not democratic. It's not the way we want to run our society. And certainly uh, on BronxNet, we encourage everybody to get as informed as possible. So uh, I, I will list all the candidates who did not appear this uh, season and had the opportunity to. They flat turned it down. Eric Stevenson, uh, George Alvarez, Dion Powell, Cynthia Cox, um, and uh, that was in the 79th Assembly District, Marcus Goffrey Bay, and Reverend Ruben Diaz in the 15th Congressional District. That aside, we're going to press on with our uh, program uh, this evening. And uh, so it uh, gives me great pleasure uh, to uh, present to you uh, our um, a candidate for the 85th Assembly District who agreed to join us. And we really are thankful for Kenny Burgess to uh, be with us. Nice to have you, sir. And um, how's the campaign going? Let's start there. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, Gary. Um, it's an honor to be here. And the campaign has been, it's been going well. I mean, as best as can be. Uh, obviously, you know, we're facing a multitude of crises and, and just obviously the pandemic in our neighborhood and specifically in the Bronx. But, uh, but besides that, the campaign's been going well. We've been engaging with voters safely and as best we can, and um, we've been received very well. Has it been difficult to campaign during this uh, particular time when, of course, uh, the people's lives are upended and then, of course, in the middle of it, we've thrown a significant social unrest? Um, is it hard to get people to, uh, you know, look and see who you are and what you're all about? Uh, it certainly is. This is my first campaign, so I don't have a, a campaign to compare it to, but I've worked on other campaigns and I can say just, you know, since the beginning, right, from the petition process when Governor Cuomo had to reduce the signature because it was just a safety issue. You know, you had residents who didn't want to open their doors and understandably so, um, you know, we didn't know what was going on at the time. So just getting signatures was difficult, uh, you know, as you go more down the weeks just raising funds, you know, you wanna, you wanna be sensitive to the times. You have 40 million unemployed across America and you don't wanna be insensitive and say, hey, you know, we need a donation for our campaign. But the reality is democracy must go on, right? And campaigns are not free. Um, so we've been, you know, creative and we're trying to be sensitive in, in our campaign 
uh, fundraising, but um, it certainly has been difficult. But like I said, we're, we're pushing through it and we've been doing really well. We have a, a team of volunteers who are energized. They've, again, been very, very safe in their practices and been energized. So I can't ask you much more than that. I guess when you visualize a campaign and you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to be uh, running for office, then you say, uh, you know, maybe I'll go to subway stops or we'll get some materials to hand out. And all that is, uh, has been thrown out the window during um, uh, this very, very unusual uh, campaign season. Well, I, I mean, I don't want to uh, belabor the point, but this is exactly yeah. why I was talking about the value of, you know, getting opportunity to be on TV. So you're here uh, alone uh, on this program this evening. Why don't you just talk a little bit about your experience and what brought you to this point and why you think you would be a, um, a good assembly member in the 85th Assembly District? Yeah, so um, I was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, I was born split family home. Both my parents are union workers, both living in the Bronx. Um, but I spent a lot of my time with my mother growing up. I then attended Bronx High School of Science then went on to the University of Albany and graduated with a bachelor's in economics. Uh, and it was my time in college where, you know, my interest in government kind of peaked. <clears throat> so this, I'll put you in the year about 2014. This is when uh, we had the murder of Eric Gardner at the hands of NYPD um, through a chokehold, which is now banned. Uh, we also had the murder of Michael Brown. So there was already civil unrest, you know, we already had racial injustices going on for many years, but the Black Lives Matter movement had begun uh, a few years before. So obviously being in university, we had students who took a stance, you know, we were upset and rightfully so. I was a part of a predominantly African-American fraternity, still am, IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. And we created a coalition with other fraternities and sororities and other community organizations in Albany, again, to make that stance. So that's what kind of piqued me because we ran into some issues with the Albany Police Department and the administration and we worked together to finally uh, be able to protest and make our voice heard um, and and it worked out well so I was I was amazed at how we were able to work with the powers that be and make our voices heard so the following year my roommate and I ran for student government at the University of Albany he became the president of the student council and I was a sitting senator of the student government um, and so then again, I just continued that path throughout government from student government. I then interned at the New York City Council. Uh, upon graduation, I began working for the community I, I lived in, right in Soundview. I worked for Council District 18 right after graduation, and it was an honor. You know, I had the opportunity to work and live uh, besides the constituents and my neighbors. So I operated with, 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 I believe, a different level of passion because, again, I lived there and I was truly concerned with how we were going to move forward in our community. Um, so as the years went on, we then had the announcement of Assemblyman Marcos Crespo no longer running. Um, so I felt this was an opportunity again, right? We, we need to have people who have been doing the work, who have the experience and who are going to operate with the passion of really caring about the community that they were not only born in, but currently live in and have worked beside for so many years. So uh, it was a short timeline, but I stepped up to the, you know, to the plate and I put in my uh, candidacy for the race. You know, I'm wondering, uh, after hearing your story about the, the political work that you did in student government at Albany, at that point, did you say to yourself, gee whiz, you know, maybe one day I ought to run for office? Um, or did that it was like, well, I'm doing this now, but who yeah. knows what will happen in the future? Uh, you know, so I obviously ran for office in student government, but it, it wasn't something that I thought I would do. Uh, you know, it, it just seemed so unattainable at the time, right? I mean, just becoming an elected official, I guess, from where I was at that point, I felt you had to be in this political family. You had to be well connected. I mean, I, I was born into, again, a union family, but my parents weren't politically active. They couldn't even honestly tell you who their local leaders were. So it just seemed so unattainable for me. It's not something that I aspired to do. I just wanted to get the work done as best as best I can in whatever capacity I could. Uh, so running for office kind of really came later in the years. And, and, and here you are uh, now. Uh, let's uh, talk about some issues. I know there are a lot of things that are important to you. And of course, you already raised uh, the um, issue of uh, Eric Garner and what happened to him. And here we are in uh, 2020, having a much more dramatic uh, dialogue about it, much more widespread. Um, you know, what, what, what do we do? So 50A has already been uh, repealed. Uh, what do we do? Uh, and, and there have been other uh, innovations uh, that uh, the governor has already signed off on. Uh, what do we need to do to establish a greater sense of justice, uh, social justice in the 85th, the Bronx and beyond? I think the protesters have it right on the ball, right? I think we need to, we need to relook 
uh, our police infrastructure from the ground up. We need to completely reimagine it. You know, policing has uh, roots in slavery. You know, it began as slave patrol, and eventually we get to where we are now, right? We've been protesting and, and rioting for decades now. And why? Because you're make, making small reforms. So I'm a believer that, you know, the NYPD and this should be recreated across the country and other localities. Uh, we need to relook at their budget, uh, relook their budget. NYPD has a $6 billion budget. It's completely bloated. You know, they're militarized. Um, and we've seen firsthand through videos and how they interact with peaceful protesters. So we need to take a, a new stance and a new viewpoint on how policing should be in our communities. Reinvest that into our communities, into our schools, into mental health uh, services. And we, I'm a believer we've given police just too many roles, right? It's not to abolish the police completely, but they're essentially social workers with guns at this point. And it hasn't worked up until now, as we can see. So uh, a divestment of at least $1 billion just to demilitarize and again, reimagine policing is a start. You know, we need to uh, pass the Police Stat Act to give us more accountability. And we can see, uh, you know, kind of the data of who's being arrested, what for, and what areas. And, um, and I think there's a lot more steps going forward from there, but we have to take it step by step and we, and we just can't take it in, in, in small strides. We have to take some really bold leaps to really reimagine policing in our communities now so we can have greater equality and, and just a greater equity. It was seen a, a number of years ago that Comstat was, uh, you know, a very innovative way of looking at crime. And the, what you just said is we need a way of tracking arrests and who's getting arrested and why. And maybe it is time then uh, to take a look at, at the data of who's getting arrested, what were those circumstances, and then analyze those trends. Uh, you have been involved in budgets and in uh, you know how things get apportioned. You know, you say a billion dollars. Well, you know, if there's six billion being spent on the police force, that takes one sixth and uh, puts it elsewhere. It, is the money there to um, uh, apportion, let's say, from the police force, from uh, the traditional criminal justice uh, work, and put it toward social services is the money there i mean how do you see the literal budgetary apportionment of uh, those kinds of uh, uh, you know re-evaluations of our our criminal justice system yeah so there was actually a, a candidate for district attorney who put out a, a a nice graphic and i apologize i don't have the name but he essentially broke it down right so the nypd budget for one billion dollars we can break some of that down uh we have i think 233 million in just excessive overtime. Now, I'm not here, you know, taking a stance that we need to take money from police officers' paychecks, but when we have levels of overtime that are just through the roof, it speaks not only to the waste of taxpayer dollars, but it speaks to the overwork of NYPD officers, right? I mean, we already know we can't have any sort of individual work 15, 16 hour shifts, seven days a week, because mentally you're just not going to be completely capable of doing your job. And at a job that's such high risk and, and and so sensitive such a, as a police officer, we just can't afford to have that, that level of, of, again, of exhaustion of just so many risks that, that, can, that can happen with just working so much overtime. So cutting overtime could be one. Um, again, demilitarization, demilitarization, you have NYPD officers and, and precincts that have grenade launchers, tear gas. I mean, just this militarized weaponry that should be completely unnecessary in our communities. Policing should be on a local level, neighborhood policing, we're, we're not going to war with our citizens. So when you break down this budget, and a lot of the NYPD budget is just hidden in secrecy. So we really can't dive super deep into the NYPD budget just because of the secrecy that it has. But we're positive that at $6 billion, it's just extremely bloated. And once you cut off at least $1 billion, again, that reinvestment into schools, into community centers, is going to help not only decrease crime, but just create better neighborhoods and will decrease the need for certain services that we've asked police officers to do. Like I said, we can't have police officers be social workers. That's not what they were intended to be. You know, uh, we do that in healthcare, and uh, we talk about preventative healthcare. We spend, uh, and, and in an increasing way, and of course now the healthcare system, we can talk about that in a moment, yeah. but the healthcare system has been, you know, a kind of rearranged because of uh, the pandemic. But in the perfect world, we've done, a, we spend a lot of money and a lot of resource on uh, preventative care, on uh, health education, et cetera, seems to me, um, you know, we, we might do a similar kind of thing when it comes to prevention. 
get yeah. more kids productive activities and, and all those kinds of things. I want to raise uh, something that has come up and, and um, just to be clear about your experience. Now, you have worked as a budget director uh, in uh, uh, Reverend Diaz's council office. Uh, do I have that correct? Um, many people would say, and he's uh, certainly a, a, um, a lightning rod figure in the Bronx because uh, many of his um, uh, positions on a, a range of uh, social issues. Um, do you, uh, are you in sync with those issues? Where, where are you in sync with and where do you uh, break away from uh, some of uh, Reverend Diaz's uh, concepts? Yeah, so I mean, ideologically, Reverend Diaz, um, you know, I've worked under his, his uh, office, but he does have his own ideological views. And, and we spoke about this and he knows this very well. You know, I completely disagree on his stance on abortion, on gay marriage, on LGBTQ rights, um, and, and many other issues. But the reason I work in the council office and again, having this conversation, I started with Councilwoman Annabelle Palmer on the 18th, uh, servicing the district again that I lived in. Uh, she had turned out, Reverend Diaz won the election and asked me to join his team. Now, uh, in the capacity I was, I was able to join, he allowed me to have a, a, not autonomy, but a, a very large input in the budget, which again, we wanted to have that consistency. We wanted to make sure a lot of the programmatic dollars for discretionary funds, a lot of the capital projects that we had in the works continued and were continued in our district. You know, it's, it, we've seen it time and time again where, you know, elected offices change and it's just the nature of politics where a new elected official comes in and all the priorities of the previous one can get turned to the wayside just because of, you know, different priorities or different agendas. Uh, so. It allowed me the opportunity to, to give our district and our community that consistency. Again, we had affordable housing process coming in. We had senior services. So me coming in was strictly in a, in a budgetary aspect, right? I was able to keep that, that programmatic funding consistent and the capital dollars consistent. Um, but as far as ideological views, um, me and Reverend Diaz do separate many different ways. And again, like I said, we've been very open. We had this conversation. So that's the capacity we were able to serve in. Uh, let's talk, you, you mentioned uh, housing and uh, affordable housing, of course, uh, another lightning rod issue uh, in the borough of the Bronx. Um, yeah. how, how do you see being able to deliver affordable housing uh, and uh, develop our borough of the Bronx without gentrifying it? Of course, um, all, all of those things that I just mentioned are, uh, used to re reuse the word lightning rod topics. Um, talk to me about how does a uh, assembly member uh, uh, approach those things and uh, what do you think we ought to do uh, from the state assembly to uh, address it? So, yeah, I mean, it's no question that the Bronx is the last frontier of the city. We have the cheapest rent, we have the most land, and developers are eyeing us. And, but there's also no question that throughout New York City, we need more housing. We have a homeless crisis, people are being priced out, so we need to protect our neighbors, we need to protect the people who have lived there. And we can do that by, you know, we have to end, you know, vacancy deregulations. We have to end MCIs that are, that, you know, developers use and landlords use to push our people out. Uh, but furthermore, bringing in affordable housing, I've, I've been a, a big advocate and I've been, I've been speaking out about this for years, is that we cannot continue to use area median income for these affordable housing projects. Too often we have a project come in where it's geared for let's say even extremely low income people, but this is based on area median income for the entire New York City. Now, anyone within New York City knows that it's a tale of two cities, right? People who live in Manhattan make astonishingly more than people who live in the Bronx. So when you create a median income based on the entire city, it's not representative of the neighborhood. What we need to do is have more of a neighborhood median income so that affordable housing is priced according to the people who, again, live in that neighborhood. We've done great jobs at, you know, putting 50% aside for the people who live in that community board, but we don't often meet that cap. You can talk to any community board district manager or, or chair or members of the board, and we almost never reach the 50% set aside units for that area, and you have to ask yourself why. It's because the area median income is not representative of that neighborhood. When you put $65,000, $75,000 as the income ban for a neighborhood that's you know, predominantly working class, has high levels of poverty, you know, the, 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 median, the income levels in that area are much lower than 65000 So how are they to afford these new apartments? So when you couple that with landlords who have been here for years, and again, who are deregulating apartments, who are pushing people out, we're going to have the same gentrification that we've seen throughout the city. So we need to push for these bold changes. Again, every median income has just been horrible for affordable housing. Um, and one more thing we need to push, which, you know, the city council has done a great job, was the right to counsel in housing court. 
And I think we need to expand that at a state level. Uh, it's proven, right? We, I think evictions went down nearly 27%. So it's proven when you can give low income families at least a right to counsel in similar ways that we provide counsel to other folks in, in the criminal justice system, it gives them the opportunity to fight for their housing because you should not be pressured by a landlord who has tons of money more than you, more resources, then you have to go to court and you don't even have the funds to afford a lawyer. So you're there speaking for yourself and it's, it's a tough battle, it's an uphill battle. So if the state is able to provide counsel in housing court, I think we can help keep our families in their homes. Let, let's just uh, stay with the development for a second and let's talk about, um, the developers say, you know what? We agree with Kenny Burgess. We believe that uh, there should be, um, uh, you know, affordable housing, but we can't afford to build that housing and not, you know, get get money back from, you know, from higher rents. Is there enough money in the development community to build this kind of affordable housing? I always question, you know, that commentary because that's that's always the argument that's made, right? Is, you know that it's just not uh, financially feasible. We can't we can't do it. We can't, we can't get do it. it at those rents. We could, and and I'm not a believer of that. I believe again because these affordable housing projects have mixed levels of income, so we can set aside enough for the people who can't afford those units at much lower rents, and they never take into account the equity in the actual building. You know, you have the cost of the building and you're going to work out a, you know, a budgetary plan based on that cost and, and very cut and dry. But at the end of the day, when you're, when your residents are paying the rent to pay down the mortgage or your bank loan to build the development you just built, that you possibly rezone, the equity level you've created with that building is, is much higher than what you purchased it for. Sometimes they're doubling their profit just off on the purchase and the rezoning in itself. So I'm not a believer that they cannot make it financially feasible. It's absolutely doable but they're gonna obviously cut their bottom line as much as they can and as much as you know, legislators are, are willing to give them. So we can't get into that argument because it's financially feasible for sure. Uh, it, it's an interesting time in Albany right now because um, uh, you know, it's decidedly blue, in, <laughs> at least for the moment. Of course, uh, we won't presume anything uh, you know, coming in the coming term. Hopefully it's uh, that way. Well, you know, that, that's your job to work on that, I suppose. Um, so it, it is interesting. Um, so many of the things that you talk about, maybe you'll find like-minded uh, people in Albany uh, to work with. Let's talk about healthcare. Um, we have uh, seen a very uh, new look at healthcare and uh, the importance of healthcare. Um, there are many, I mean, I can list them, Obamacare, single payer, universal, private based, public option, Medicare for all. Uh, when you go to Albany and, and there's no question, one way, blue, red, or otherwise, uh, one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issue, is going to be revising our health system in the state of New York. Um, what do you foresee and what would you recommend? Yeah, so I mean, I, as you stated, there, there are a multitude of options people have proposed to fix our health care system. Um, I'm a believer that the federal government needs to take charge of this. Um, you know, we're not going to shy away from it, but I'm a believer in Medicare for all. I'm a believer that you know we privatize healthcare way too much you know healthcare costs are through the roof and you should not be competing for people's lives you know end of the day this is people's lives we're talking about and you have families again individuals that just simply cannot afford prescription medication cannot afford cancer screens and other health services because of the cost so this is something that as the richest nation in the country and in the world we should be affording our residents at the very least should be Medicare for all program, but I'm willing to work again with my colleagues and, and, and other conversations that the federal government does not step up to the plate, whether it be single payer, um, what, whatever we're looking to do is, as long as we bring the cost down and, and do not decrease the services to our residents, because again, it, as a government, as a state government, as a local government, as a federal government, we should never have our residents die. And it's, it's as simple as that. It sounds morbid, but people are dying just because they can't afford a health care cost. So I'm well, looking Yep, right. Certainly, certainly right. the New York Health Act is out there. I mean, that, yes. you know, that, that is what uh, is going to be uh, worked on. Um, the Assembly um, it, it has much more unanimity about it than uh, the Senate has. Uh, yeah. But that is, is uh, clearly what the next, uh, the, you know, the next large issue in New York State uh, health reform is, is going to be. Talk, look at the district. Take a step back. Look at the 85th uh, Assembly District. Um, from an environmental point of view, uh, what are the kinds of things that are disturbing to you that contribute to so many of our uh, low uh, health indicators? And uh, what kinds of things do you think you could realistically address from a local point of view uh, in the 85th yeah. to make people healthier and, of course, improve the environment? 
Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a multi-factor thing, right? So, I mean, one, the 85th, I believe, is a healthy food desert. Um, for a long time, we just didn't even have a local supermarket in certain areas. <clears throat> but, you know, me living there, I try to lead a healthy life myself, and I've spoken to individuals, and it's just very difficult to just get a, a healthy food option. We have probably every fast food chain, you know, in the area. So just attracting, you know, a new healthy food option would be one that would help immensely, you know, to health issues and all kinds of disparities we have. Um, we also have a big crossroads of highways. Um, and we know for a fact the Cross Bronx for many years has been, you know, the biggest contributor to asthma levels of children, of families that live around the Cross Bronx. So in the 85th, we have, you know, a crossroads where the Bronx River and the Cross Bronx and the Bruckner all meet. So at a state level, we need to take a look and reimagining our, our state transportation, right? We have too many trucks coming in at the same time and just cramming up the highway and they're just e emitting all these fumes on our families. So we have to get creative, whether it be certain hours for trucks to pass through, whether it be certain lanes, whether it be expansions, but we have to get real creative and, and put some real investment in infrastructure. You know, the Cross Bronx was built decades ago and it has seen no significant infrastructure investment besides you know, milling the road and, and repaving it every summer as they do. Um, and to my third point um, would be, I'm sorry, I forgot the third points, but we'll stick, we'll stick with the, um, the transportation and, and again, with the healthy food desk will be the biggest mitigators. You, you know, I look at, um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, trucks and I'll just tell you from my perspective as I move around the borough, sometimes I drive in neighborhoods or I'm even walking through neighborhoods and I'm going, why is this huge tanker truck in this neighborhood? It's, uh, you know, I guess the driver either got lost or he's looking for a shortcut and they're squeezing his big truck in these little Bronx streets. And I'm like, this doesn't uh, make sense. I guess this uh, goes under what you're, what, what you're referring to. And maybe legislation um, from the state can uh, address those things. Uh, I, yeah, I so just to, just to expand upon that, um, my third point is, it's again, it's just larger investments in, in, our, in our public transportation, right? Because it's not, I mean, the trucks are, I believe, the biggest uh, factor, again, in this traffic we have with cars, but we have families who drive to work or driving around, typically one person in a car. Now, we already know if you invest in your public transportation system, you know, we have the ferry in Soundview, but we have a crippling, a, a crumbling uh, subway station in Parkchester, which is not the 85th, but very near. Um, you know, we have slow bus service, but if we improve all of this, you can incentivize a lot of families who live in these transit deserts out in, in my district to take public transportation, maybe leave the car at home, and you're going to reduce emissions, you're going to reduce traffic, and you're going to have an overall much healthier area for the children there, for the families there, and it would just work entirely for New York City. Well, I'm, I'm smiling because... <laughs> I, I'm smiling because Mr. Budget Director, uh, you know, the MTA needs money. And uh, well, I think, it, you know, we, you and I would need a, another half hour to unpack uh, exactly how we're going to handle that. But um, uh, I, I think everybody would agree we'd love to uh, create more infrastructure in um, uh, transportation. Uh, uh, Kenny Burgos, uh, we have um, come to the uh, end of our program. Like we would in a debate, I'd give you 30 seconds for a closing statement. Uh, and, and we do regret that the other candidate didn't want to appear, but uh, we've certainly enjoyed our time with you. So we'll give you 30 seconds. You can do your um, uh, final um, uh, wrap up uh, right now. That would be great. Thank you, Gary. So yeah, um, you know, for all those watching, if you live in the 85th district, um, I'm ho hopefully you have swayed your vote a bit. Um, if not, you can find some more information about me at kennyburgos.nyc. Uh, follow all my social media accounts at kennyburgosny. I handle a social media account. It's not a staff or an intern, so you'll be speaking directly with me. I'm very responsive. Um, and voice any concerns and issues that may, I may have not raised. You know, I, I'm looking to hear from our constituents. I want to not be only my voice. I want to obviously be the voice for the residents who live in our district. So please reach out to me, connect with me, and I'm happy to talk. And thank you for having me on, Gary. Great. And thank you, uh, Kenny Burgos, for uh, joining us. And uh, good luck uh, through the rest of uh, uh, the campaign. Um, stay safe, I guess, would be the bottom line. I think we'd all uh, advise everybody to do that, and we appreciate uh, your, ti your time uh, this evening. Uh, we'll mention to uh, all the people watching our primary uh, in the uh, uh, 85th, and of course all the primaries are scheduled for June 23rd. Uh, we advise every uh, voter to get out and vote. Note that the voting can be done by absentee ballot. Uh, to get your ballot, you visit uh, vote.nyc. We want to thank our collaborators, the League of Women Voters, for more information, please call the League at 212-725-3541. Uh, Co-sponsors, the Bronx Times 
and Schnapps Media. Uh, we'll be back with uh, Bronx Talk next week. Uh, and um, we want to thank our uh, producer, Helen Greenberg. And uh, make sure you vote on the 23rd. Uh, good luck again to you, uh, Mr. Burgos, in the uh, rest of the campaign. And uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.